<laughs> now, one, uh, one line of study that's gotten a lot of interest in paleontology in the last decade and a half is reconstructing the growth histories, the life strategies of dinosaurs. And tyrannosaurs are one of the groups that we're able to do this with. So how do we approach that? Well, I said before that tyrannosaurs is one of the few dinosaurs we've got lots and lots of individuals with, and that's the important thing, because those individuals are different ages. So on this uh, picture here, the different colors are different individual specimens. This is a tiny little specimen that's on display at LA. Uh, this is a specimen in Cleveland. There's another one, another one, there's Sue in the back. I think that's Sue. Uh, all shown to the same scale. And we can see the changes in shape throughout their life. So this is that specimen from LA. It's a two-year-old, and I'll explain momentarily how we figure that out. Uh, here is Jane, who's an 11-year-old. Uh, here is the original specimen, who's something like 20 or 22-ish. Uh, and Jane herself, or his self, um, is um, 28, somewhere between 28 and 29. Now, how do we possibly know that? Well, it turns out that like some animals, some modern animals, including alligators and so forth, there are many reptiles that do this, and there are some mammals that do this. They grow tree, basically like tree rings, annual rings inside their bone called lines of arrested growth, or lags. And in fact, this alligator section here uh, was part of an experiment, a long running experiment, to actually demonstrate these were annual cycles. So they knew the age of this individual because they hatched it. And they, they measured them like at different numbers of the population they killed at different stages and counted up the rings at the time. So they figured out the, these lads are indeed uh, evidence of the age of the individual at time of death. So kind of like a tree, you just cut it up and you count the rings, except there's some complicating factors. I mean, bones get remodeled and parts of them get resorbed. So you have to call, cut multiple bones to try to find the maximum number of rings I think it's your minimum age for that individual. Oh, there's something else you can do with that. This is the rib of Sue. And uh, we can see here, you don't see the earlier growth stages, there's 13, 14, 15, all up to 19. And then if you look up the very end of that, there's another batch of very closely spaced um, lines of arrested growth that show the, that's called the external fundamental system. And it shows that body size had finally achieved the maximum, basically. Dinosaurs basically plateau out. They may grow a little bit, but not very much after they reach a certain size. So they were called determinant growth. Um, and in fact, by counting up these additional lags here, it turns out that Sue died sometime between laying down the 28th growth rate and before laying down the 29th growth ring. So she, she or he died between 28 and 29. But we can do more with that, because if we know the age of time of death and the size of the individual, we can plot them up to produce growth curves for that species. And here are the growth curves for four of the different uh, tyrannosaurs, including T. rex itself. So there's Sue right there. Uh, and we see the tyrannosaurs grew relatively slowly until they were about 10 or so, and then grew really rapidly until about age 19, and then petered out. They stopped growing really fast. Now, uh, that pattern, you know, slow growth until 10, rapid growth from 10 to 19, and uh, uh, petering out at about age 19, that's our growth curve. That's a human growth curve. So long as you ignore the numbers here, and humans don't get up to six, seven, eight tons or whatever. Um, but tyrannosaurs had sort of a human-like lifestyle for their early part. But an interesting thing is we don't find very old individuals in tyrannosaurs, or indeed any dinosaur. If you were to go out and look at populations of elephants today, you would find a lot of that population is full-grown adults. And that's because after they achieve full body size, they live for decades, 70, 80, 90 years, even longer before uh, large-scale hunting and, wiped out, and, and, and farming and wiped out a lot of the population. Rhinos, similarly, many decades. Whales, it looks like centuries. No dinosaur seems to have lived longer than about 50. And most groups of dinosaurs didn't make it to 20. 
Tyrannosaurs are sort of rare in that context. They make their way up. But, uh, Sue may be the oldest at 28 and a half. There's some evidence there's another specimen that may be about 30. Uh, that's about it. But that has to do with sort of the different life strategy. Because big mammals typically only have one baby at a time, maybe two. An elephant, after a two-year gestation period, one baby. Uh, a rhino, a, a year and a half gestation, one or two babies. Dinosaurs, clutches of 24 babies at a time, every year. So you don't have to live for many decades to keep a viable population. You just shoot out a lot of babies, some of them might make it to adulthood. <laughs> um, so where did Tyrannosaurus and its relatives come from? And this is a, a line of research that I was involved early on uh, in my, uh, uh, my graduate career, and actually so, as well as with the locomotion stuff. Uh, although a lot of new evidence has come to light. Now, it seemed natural to many people after the discovery of T-Rex that Tyrannosaurus were somehow maybe the, simply the final expression of a long history of giant, long, giant large body meat-eating dinosaurs. That the Allosaurs, or so-called Carnosaurs, uh, went from Jurassic forms to early Cretaceous forms to early late Cretaceous forms to Tyrannosaurus big all the time. But even early on, some of the early researchers had noticed anatomical similarities between Tyrannosaurs and not these giant forms around little dinosaurs, dinosaurs of a meter or two meters long, three or six feet long. Uh, and this is an idea that I, I, I propose calling the Tyrannoraptor hypothesis. I didn't come up with a hypothesis, I put a name on it. But the question is how do we figure out which one is accurate, which is the proper position of Tyrannosaurus on the tree, the family tree of dinosaurs. And thankfully, in the 1980s, methods were developed by which we could uh, identify lots of characteristics on the anatomy of animals, uh, code them into a matrix, and let a computer sort out what is the simplest possible solution for those positions. May not be the right solution, because new evidence will come along and it may overturn what we have, but this is the best solution for the evidence at hand. And those of us doing work here in the, in the 1980s and 90s found unanimously Tyrannosaurus were, in fact, small body meters grown large. They were not particularly close to Allosaurus and Spinosaurus and Negosaurus and so forth. Um, their closest relatives were the ostrich dinosaurs and the raptors and some other very small bodied dinosaurs, collectively called the Silurosaurs. Now, one of the things that was really interesting about that is at the same time, we were finding there was another group of Silurosaurs that actually we had known about all along but didn't really realize were Silurosaurs, and those were birds. Because with the skeletal anatomy of the early birds and the newly discovered anatomy of dinosaurs like Velociraptor and Deinonychus and Truodon and so forth, it turned out that birds were part of the dinosaur family tree. They were nearly theropod dinosaurs, that is, meat eaters. Uh, they were specifically in one branch of the Solarosauria. So T. rex's closest living relatives are the birds. Of course, that's true for Triceratops as well. But another way of thinking about it is Tyrannosaurus was more closely related to a roadrunner than it was to Allosaurus. Which is a very weird thing to think about. <laughs> Now, since that initial work we did in doing the family trees of the Tyrannosaurus and their position in the, the family trees of, of dinosaurs, a huge amount of evidence has happened. In the last 12 years, all these were brand new discoveries of early Tyrannosaurs. There's a couple more on the way. Um, these guys were long-known dinosaurs, so some back to 1866 that turned out to be early Tyrannosaurs. Um, and a handful which are maybe early Tyrannosaurs or maybe a branch or two out. So a huge database of creatures which allow us to reconstruct what the early phases of Tyrannosaur history were like. Uh, I should point collectively, these guys are called the Tyrannosauroidea, and I know this is one of those things that in biological nomenclature, all these names that sound the same as Tyrannosaurus, and Tyrannosauridae, and Tyrannosauroidea. Oidea is the big one. That's the, the, the whole cluster of them. And many of these earlier forms were much tinier animals. So that's the skull of DeLong shown to scale with the skull of Sue. 
Or here's a reconstruction of men in these early forms and a human being. Although, why she's not running, I don't know. Because <laughs> um, yeah. although these aren't the size of Tyrannosaurus or Gorgosaurus or Tarbosaurus, they could still mess you up. Uh, and after all, you know, a jaguar could seriously mess you up, and it's the size of some of these guys. So the early members of the Tyrannosauroids uh, were nowhere near as large, and they had a very different anatomy. For example, here's the arm of one of the early ones. It's a long arm, much longer than its skull. It ends, although we don't have all the, the fingers on that specimen, in a nice big three-fingered hand, a grasping hand. It's not an animal with a useless tiny two-fingered hand. This is something catching its prey with these great big hands. And it still has knife-like teeth. But certain aspects of anatomy show that Guan Long, a Jurassic form, was actually an early branch of the Tyrannosaur line. A fast-moving, fast-running, grasping animal. Slightly later in time is a smaller form uh, called Delong, uh, a wonderful specimen that was the first Tyrannosaur found with feathers, or at least fuzz. The reason we can recover the fuzz there is it died in a lake in China. Now, lake deposits are really good at preserving the tiny, fine details, the hair on mammals, the scale on the skins of lizards, the flowers of ancient flowering plants, and so forth. And it turns out the feathers of dinosaurs. Because from these deposits, we've been finding that many types of dinosaurs have feathers. Now, we had established back in the 1980s that birds were part of the dinosaur family tree, that they were solarosaurs. But we didn't know when feathers began. Did they begin close to the first bird? Were they birds and their raptors, their closest kin? Was it further down the tree? Where did they show up? These discoveries have allowed us, us to reconstruct where they showed up. And it turned out tyrannosaurs had these things. Now, when the very first feathered dinosaur showed up out of China in the uh, mid-1990s, I and some of my colleagues predicted we were going to find feathers in early tyrannosaurs. And the reason we predicted that is those early feathered dinosaurs that were found were based on their family tree position further away from birds than T-Rex. And so it's at least the early members of the Tyrannosaurus were almost certainly fuzzy. But maybe not T-Rex itself, I mean, because after all, it's a big animal. It's a multi-ton animal. All we look today, elephants are mammals. We mammals are famous for being very hairy. But elephants are not particularly hairy, as not as adults. And the big animals are at a high environment. They don't need a lot of fur. So maybe T-Rex wasn't fuzzy. That was a great line of logic. Uh, there's a reconstruction of DeLong. Uh, until a couple years ago, when this guy was found, Eutyrannus, a 1.4 ton early Tyrannosaur from China, the largest dinosaur yet found from these lake deposits, and it's got feathers all over its body. Actually, multiple individuals have been found with these feathers on it, uh, and it's all over the body. It's a fuzzy animal. We cannot say for certain yet that the Tyrannosaurus rex had feathers. But if we map out on the family tree where we see this fuzzy sort of body covering, and I'll say none of the direct relatives of Tyrannosaurus have true feathers. True feathers with a shaft and the branches around that, branches around that are limited so far as we know to this one little, little branch here. But this simple fuzz is widely distributed, almost certainly in the common ancestor of all these guys, and therefore almost certainly passed on to all of its descendants, including Tyrannosaurus and its closest relatives. So I don't think it makes it any less scary. You know, I hear people say, oh, you know, if they're fuzzy, they make less scary. I don't know. Lions are kind of fuzzy, and you know, they're kind of terrifying. <laughs> um, so it's not what we picture them like, you know, but. But who knows at this moment? We don't have a Tyrannosaurus rex from a lake deposit that would show this yet. Hopefully someday. Okay. But of course, uh, Tyrannosaurus uh, is no longer with us, which is probably a good thing. Um, because it was one of those unlucky dinosaurs to have been around at the time of the great asteroid impact 66 million years ago. Uh, that brought an end to that world. And as I said at the beginning, uh, towards the beginning, if there were individuals of Tyrannosaurus that happened to be looking in the right direction, they might have seen over the horizon the flash 
uh, uh, the impact in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, certainly they felt it by the end, because Tyrannosaurus Rex, the last individuals would have died sometime during the catastrophe of the next days, weeks, months, years, however long it took to, to change the world uh, to one that is now lacking in these giant scaly and we now infer fuzzy animals. Mm. So uh, with that, uh, I thank you for, uh, for being here, for your attention, and I'll take any questions if you have any. compared to most dinosaurs. Part of their, their transformation, becoming more aerodynamic, sort of swelled out the body, the tops are broader across. So tyrannosaurs were much narrow at the hips. So that, that's probably part of the problem birds have. As for, so for backing up, I really can't say for turning, one of the lines of evidence, or a series of computer models looking at that pinched foot structure in tyrannosaurs shows it's actually quite resistant to torsion. And so they probably can turn relatively quickly, uh, maybe even high speed. Oh, and then a second element of that is the dinosaurs in general, with their longer bony tails, could have used that like a cheetah and so forth uses, or the most modern man mammal tail mammals use it as a counterbalance while turning. And where birds don't have that anymore because their tails are real, the bony part of the tail is really short. So they don't have that element to help turn around quickly. Um, so tyrannosaurs were probably relatively good at turning. Probably the best, the shortest turning radius of any of the dinosaurs were the raptors, um, who have really mobile tails right at the hips, and then a really stiffened rod for the rest of the tail, almost like a uh, like an acrobat's balancing beam in terms of stiffness. And it looks like they were probably really good at turning quickly, which, which matches their mode of predation, which is to really hunt down and grasp on and you know, kick at something as opposed to coming down from the throw above with giant jaws. <laughs> 